All right, so this is my primary talk, PubChem RDF, towards a semantic description of PubChem. So most of the work here has is, is been done by uh, Gong Fu, who's one of my postdocs, and is uh, really the result of four years of effort so far, well, three years of effort, uh, towards trying to provide a huge wealth of additional information, our first um, uh, linked data type project at NCBI, where I work. So uh, I work for the U.S. National Library of Medicine, and you may know that for a number of resources such as medical subject headings, MeSH, UMLS, clinicaltrials.gov, ToxNet, Daily Med, and more. So one of the uh, components of this is the NCBI, and you probably all know NCBI for PubMed, PMC, BLAST, genomes, genes, proteins, but NCBI is also uh, known for chemicals and bioassays, the PubChem project, which you may or may not have heard of. So this is our home page, and um, we have now been around for 10 years. So if you've never heard of us, yay, we finally reached you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's quite a number of resources that we've developed over a function of time, and uh, I'm not going to go too much into PubChem as a project, although I could easily spend several hours talking about different sub-parts of it. So our primary goal is to be an online resource that provides comprehensive information on the biological activities of, used to be small molecules, uh, but now I would say it's substances, chemical substances. And it's not just small molecules, but also peptides, nucleotides, uh, carbohydrates, um, diesel fuel, hydrolyzed chicken feathers, plant extract 45, uh, you name it. Basically anything that you have as a sample and that you can test in a biological experiment could be a chemical substance. So uh, if you want to think of PubChem, it's uh, an online archive that you can contribute information, um, biological experiments, chemical structures, cross-references. But we, the idea here is that uh, PubChem aggregates information, but we don't go out and pull data in per se but rather people push their data in. So uh, we have a data transfer agreement, and, uh, but we're also a public resource. Anybody can access it. Um, we, we try to provide some tools uh, for you to search, subset, select, analyze. Um, and so in terms of our primary data, people contribute chemical substance descriptions, and uh, they provide <coughs> descriptions of, of assays, uh, which are the experiments that people perform on these chemical substances. But we also have this derived database, which is our most popular, which is called PubChem Compound, where people go in and, and get the unique set of chemicals that are there. Um, the only caveat is, is that substances that are not well defined or not a compound, uh, we're considering to create a PubChem Biologics resource. So those of you who, who follow the drug space, you know, in 2010 there were no uh, biologics top 10 grossing drugs, and in 2012 there was 50% and um, 2013 it was 70%. So it's sort of the rise of the biologics. So people have exp information on these and, and it's kind of going towards the future. But I just say this to, to give you some idea. So we have quite a bit of data. Um, this is growth over a nine year period. Um, nearly 300 uh, contributors to date. Um, over 170 some million chemical substance descriptions, 62 million small molecules. Uh, for thousands of biological targets, uh, two million tested chemicals couple hundred million uh, biological activity results, over a million bioassays, and so on. So really it's a rather large corpus is, is a general idea here. Uh, so what we're trying to do now is to take this information from these various resources, uh, integrate it all together with information about drugs, genomes, sequences, and so on, uh, to try and stitch together some sort of a, a data cloud so that someone can start to reason and, and, and work with this information if you want to know how a publication relates to a protein and a substance or a patent or whatever, you can, you can do all that. So, you know, as we're trying to, to stitch this together, you, you have to find ways in which this data can work together. So you have to find uh, authoritative sources, ontologies and whatnot to allow you to sort of describe this information uh, within this space. And um, I can tell you where we don't do any data curation. We contain curated data, although we do do some cleanup to try and make sure that what's there is consistent. Uh, it's, a, um, it's an interesting uh, way to approach things. So linked data, um, we're all here. We think we have an idea. 
uh, about what this is, um, just to make sure uh, it's a term to describe the practice of exposing uh, data and connecting it to together. Uh, but really, it's, it's about uh, linking data that hasn't linked before. And I'm going to go through some of this really quickly. You already know this. But as you all know, talks are meant to, for people who are going to read this later on. Um, you saw this slide earlier. One of the big problems we have is that we have loads of, of provenance information. So um, we have lots of facts and then uh, just loads of people telling us a lot of the same thing. It's interesting that times are changing, so RDF linked data is really coming along. I was at a, a, a workshop at FDA, US FDA, uh, this last week, and there they're trying to uh, bring together the, in their standards um, RDF information, and they now have, you know, OWL representations of standards, and they found that it's better than using UML because it provides them capabilities to verify mappings. But really what they're trying to do is to bridge the, uh, the public domain health area with the life sciences domain. So if you're doing adverse, adverse uh, event reporting, you want to try and mine that information. How do you bring all this together? And so they have models like um, uh, the Health Level 7 uh, CDIS bridge model uh, to sort of approach this. Uh, and now, as we pretty much speak, uh, Mesh RDF will have been released. So this is the second NLM project that has an RDF data. And so if you're interested in the links, the URLs, they're right here. Um, take a quick picture of it before I change the slide. Uh, but you can access this right now. Uh, they may or may not have announced this, so you know you get to hear it here first. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. All right, here it goes. <laughs> All right, so uh, PubChem RDF was released in January 2014. Uh, it's released as a beta. It provides RDF formatted information. We consider RDF a file format flavor. So um, uh, that's sort of how we think of RDF. Uh, it's only a subset of what we have. There's a RESTful interface, and you can download it in, in bulk. We don't want to create ontologies. We try to use vocabularies very sparingly and we engage the community with these various ontologies to either add terms that represent the information we have or we use vocabulary. So um, the idea here is to help us uh, integrate all this information. If you want to read more about it, um, this is our release notes, uh, pubchem slash RDF. It's a 42 page document. We're about to switch this out and uh, update it. So uh, think of like uh, PubChem RDF Beta 1.5, uh, where we include the drug space and uh, a lot more of the information as links to, to PubMed. Um, but right now, in terms of coverage, what you see out there is uh, various bits of substance and assay data, but also uh, compound data. Uh, the chemical chemical similarity represents um, a huge chunk of this information. Uh, there are over 50 billion um, chemical chemical links. Uh, similarity links, and these are things that are very closely related, um, as well as target type data. Uh, so this is sort of how it looks today, um, if you were to download it. And it's already starting to look a little complex, and we've, we've barely touched any of the data that we have. So you know, trying to think of simplified models for this is, is, is an issue for us. Uh, but we touch a lot of different subdomains. Um, just listing these here, you can read about them uh, later or, or look at our, our help notes. Oops. Uh, we use a whole bunch of different ontologies um, because the data that we have is so diverse, we have to pull from all over the place to find something that describes it. You know, uh, if you want to describe units, you need a unit ontology. You want to describe, um, uh, I don't know, um, chemicals, you need a chemical ontology. If you want to uh, work with citations, you need a citation ontology and so on. And so this number will only grow. But the nice thing is there is that we don't have to get into the business of making these, which I hope is a good thing. Um, I'm going to just show you some graphs real quick just to show you that it's complex. We're only showing you really trivial stuff, but the, the link, data linking is, is complex for people to grab. But we have lots of information about how information, uh, how, how the, these different nodes can connect together. Uh, and as we expose more of what people want, these, these get only more complex. This is some, some subset of the substance information, how it relates to compound. Uh, this is compound to other compound type data. 
to give you some idea. Oh boy, already. <laughs> so here's a chemical similarity, and the nice thing here is uh, RDF provides a means for us to to give you back out the details of chemical similarity. Uh, but even here, uh, when we first did our, our first revision of uh, PubChem RDF, we had over a trillion, actually many trillions of, of triples. And so to scale back, we, we removed a lot of these details, although you can still access it on demand. Um, this is sort of a provenance type information where we have a particular data source um, here and, and the information we have about it. Uh, here's in the context of uh, a pro, uh, a measure group, which is sort of a biological tests uh, on a particular substance, but without the protocol or other types of information about it. So this is where we're going today. I, I tried to get this released for before this meeting, but um, it just uh, it's kind of hard to move around so many gigabytes of data and to make sure everything is just up to snuff. But this is sort of the 1.5 release, and so we have links here to uh, Unipro, to Ensemble RDF, Reactome RDF. Go, Pro, the Bioassay Ontology, Kebi, um, Kemble, Cheminf, PDB RDF, Mesh RDF. Really, we're, we're, we're expanding out what we're linking to in terms of the description of the information. Um, and you'll notice that this looks a lot more complex than the earlier one that I showed you about the sort of an overview of what we cover. And um, I'm concerned about this because I think that most users aren't going to quite get it. And so we'll have to figure out some, some really smart ways to, to describe this to people so that they'll use PubChem RDF. Because if the barrier is too high for people to understand how the data is connected together, they're just not going to use it. So why are we doing it? So, um, but we're, we're, we're smart cookies. I think we'll figure it out. And I'm hopeful that the smart cookies in this audience in the biohackathon hackathon part of it, we'll be able to try and think of better ways to reduce the barriers for people to uptake and use RDF. Because I think it's going to be terribly useful. I mean, this is where everybody is going. So, you know, it, it's a nice way to summarize the type of data. And we plan internally to use this quite extensively to, um, uh, to try and help people find the most useful stuff. Because you can link to lots and lots of stuff, like you know, 10,000, 50,000 links, entities. But um, you know, I think it's a summarizing that is going to be the real chore going forward. I'll give you some idea of the numbers we're looking at. Uh, there's over 65 billion uh, links. Most of them, about uh, 50 billion of the compound links up that you see up here, which is really a good bulk of this, are the uh, chemical chemical similarity uh, type links. But look at the entities here. There's over 1.8 billion entities in this, and most of these are within the chemical descriptor space. So if you have 10 different properties about a chemical and you want to describe those, like the molecular formula, molecular weight, smiles, itchy, and so on, it really balloons out the number of triples that you need to use to describe that. And you can see we're being terribly efficient. I mean, per descriptor, there's only two triples that we're, we're using for each thing. So even being very economical about how we approach this, it really explodes uh, quite quickly the number of, of triples that you can expose. Uh, so we, we've been kind of taking an approach to try to minimize the number of triples while also expanding uh, what we have. And so it's if, you know, for us to think very carefully about how these things connect and doing the data modeling in a particular fashion to economize where possible the number of triples has been very keen in our mind but also how people you know, query the data. So there's an FTP site, you can download all this. There's like 250 gigs worth of data compressed. Uh, there's an Aspera client at NCBI. So if you ever go to NCBI slash download, you can get to the Aspera client uh, to, to get this fast. Uh, but what we try to do is to arrange the PubChem RDF like layers of an onion. You just download those triples that you care about. If you don't care about certain uh, sections or areas, you don't have to download it. And so by doing that, um, I think it, it's been helpful to people to minimize how much or, or what they actually uh, have to download. Uh, we use void, um, vocabulary interlinked data. So you have provenance of the data files as turtle. Yeah, we also have files based on uh, ranges of subsets. Um, you know, simple wget or something like that if you're very Unix focused. You can just download this uh, quite rapidly. We haven't updated it in a while, in part because we're transitioning to a new way of doing things. 
Uh, we don't have a Sparkle query endpoint, but we're, we'll soon be using Sparkle and Virtuoso uh, to grab uh, data for our uh, RESTful interface. Uh, the RESTful interface right now is rather simplistic. It, um, uh, it supports different file formats, um, but we'll soon add uh, ways to filter out this using a Sparkle query, in part because going to one PubChem identifier might give you many um, hundreds of thousands of triples and it may be sucking, like sucking water from a fire hose. So uh, trying to minimize that is, is difficult. Um, these are some things to come. Uh, th these are just sort of showing you some aspects of how we can deal with uh, the WHO, ATC classifications and, and things in the drug space so that you can sort of um, you know, use your Sparkle queries in, in different ways. Um, I'm gonna have to go this really quick because I'm almost out of time, so. Um, but really, uh, there, there's different ways that we've tried to make things that you can infer uh, using ontologies, um, triples. So again, trying to find ways to minimize uh, things, but also to try and keep the, uh, the sparkle very uh, simplistic, uh, wherever and however possible. Uh, again, just showing more ways you can infer things, in this case using Kebi. Um, I'm just gonna skip over this. Anyway, uh, this is released as a beta. Uh, there's really much, much more to come. The PubMed and the drugs part is coming out. We've been working, uh, we have uh, many hundreds of millions, about 200 or so million um, uh, links between chemicals and patents, which we'll uh, push out soon. Uh, but PubMed and drugs are coming out in this uh, 1.5 release. We've been working with the safety and toxicology community, and many of them are very interested in adding structure to developing ontologies in, the, in this area but also going through and um, annotating the, the text blobs we have in this area because we have huge amounts of, of data at NLM um, and other associated resources uh, within PubChem that deals in the safety and toxicology area, but they're just text blurbs. They're, they're pulled out of reports or, or they're extracted out. And having the community go out and annotate this would be very helpful. Um, but really, we're, we're still answering these questions. You know, is this what folks are expecting? Will they adopt it? We have on the uh, average about 200 users a day of our PubChem RDF, which translates to several thousand users a month. But when you compare it to the million or so users we have a month for PubChem as a whole, um, it's uh, quite small in terms of um, uptake. So if you use PubChem RDF, we'd love to hear from you, what you like, what you don't like about it, so that we can focus on the good parts and get you what you need quick. Uh, future directions, we're working with the, the folks uh, with the human disease ontology and other um, uh, vocabularies and ontologies. Uh, also with the protein uh, ontology folks to try and, and um, maybe get more useful information. Uh, yeah. Further integration uh, pro with biological assay targets. Um, just showing some additional ideas of how we can uh, associate uh, things, chemicals and diseases. Uh, again, another uh, example with uh, ATC. But really, uh, I just want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting us to this meeting, and, and um, I really appreciate your time and attention. Uh, but I can tell you that in terms of external collaborators, without really experienced folks trying to help us, uh, we wouldn't be able to get here as quickly as we have. Uh, Michelle, is uh, one of our collaborators, is in the audience. Thank you. Um, and, but also to the other uh, PubChemers that have been very helpful. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much.